Okay, welcome back to our Economics of Innovation course. I won't give a long introduction because I do that in the video anyway. The only thing I want to say that I obviously did a very bad job in uh, cutting this video, as you will see, but uh, that was one of the first videos I cut uh, anyway, so uh, hope that's okay nevertheless. Okay, so we are going to start, as always, just uh, ask questions, interrupt me in, in Webex, okay? Write something in the chat, etc. I'm happy if you ask anything. For R&D uh, activities of firms, the famous 3% goal of the European Union. So here you so see what I meant. It somehow started for whatever reasons uh, very suddenly. I just jump back and then you will see what happens and, and just start it again. For R&D uh, activities of firms, the famous 3% goal of the European Union in terms of R&D input, in terms of uh, R&D uh, spending as a percentage of GDP. Uh, then I also started to give you an overview of a few of the important work uh, horse models we will use, in particular Monopoly, and then the two models of imperfect competition, namely uh, Bertrand and uh, and then I started with uh, what is called uh, the basic model, and as you see here is still uh, what I underlined uh, last uh, week, and I was too quick right now, uh, what I underlined last week, and this was really the error model, okay? The error model which tells you or which, which answers the question, who has a stronger incentive or a higher incentive to invest in R&D? Is it a, a firm under competition, where we use Bertrand competition as a form of competition, or is it, uh, is it monopoly? Okay, and that's what I did at some extent uh, last, I think, Thursday. Uh, monopoly and perfect competition, and I don't want to, uh, to do that once again. So I want to jump right back to uh, one of the diagrams, uh, which I hope somehow summarizes all of what we did uh, last week. Namely, this is a model which you already learned. Here you see, oh, I, I think I should just, if I can, oh, I can't. So I cannot erase what I wrote last week, but the point is here we start up with our original technology uh, of co production at uh, variable or, or marginal cost K. Then we introduced uh, a process innovation leading to lower cost K bar. And what we did then, we derived what uh, the, the gain from innovation for a firm under Bertrand competition is. This would be this triangle here. Oh, I probably sh I should just use a different color. So. Uh, so this would be you no know, triangle, of course, it's a rectangle here, this rectangle here uh, for a firm under competition, whereas the, the, the monopolists would have, uh, and that's, I uh, raise it right now again, uh, because you will see it hopefully in a minute here, uh, what the monopolist has, oh, I have to write it here, uh, what the monopolist has, uh, it increases, uh, or she, uh, she increases her profit by this uh, area, but uh, in a sense loses or cannibalizes, as I called it, uh, this previous rectangle here, uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I did it some detail uh, derive what then the, uh, the, the willingness to pay for innovation would be. And the important point is here, uh, what I derived first is that the, that the, the red uh, areas are, are larger than the, than the blue one here. That meaning that the firm and the competition, the Bertrand uh, case, has a higher incentive to innovate than a monopolist. And then the, the yellow triangle tells you that the social planner has an even higher incentive uh, to uh, innovate or to invest in R&D or in exactly this R&D project, which allows you to uh, to, to realize this uh, cost reduction. And that's what I stated here. Monopolist and virtual competitor undervalue innovation compared to the social optimum. And I also explained to you that this is a so-called consumer surplus effect. Firms cannot appropriate or return from R&D. Most visibly is that in the monopoly case, because if the monopolist uh, introduces uh, an innovation, uh, the, 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 uh, as a consequence of the cost reduction, the monopolist has an incentive to decrease the price from this price up here to the lower price. Okay, I'm, I did that already last here. And so what we have here is a gaining consumer surplus for which the, the monopolist is not uh, compensated. Okay, that was it about uh, the original error model. Uh, and we, we got rather clear cut uh, consequences here, monopoly uh, leading to lower incentive to innovate than Bertrand, and both uh, having an un, uh, uh, insufficient incentive to, to uh, invest in R&D. We now want to move on to the next market structure, Cournot duopoly. I like it very much because it gives 
uh, you very nice and more, in a sense, more intuitive uh, results as, as a per draw case. Uh, as the number of firms uh, increase, uh, prices go down, for instance. And in particular, what is important here with respect to R&D, firms with different marginal costs may coexist. So uh, because you have uh, uh, marginal costs, uh, say, in your production of your car, which are one euro less than uh, the production of the, your rival, you don't drive your rival out of the car, uh, of, of this market uh, 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 completely. So inefficient firms may survive and have positive market shares. So we do not have these kind of cutthroat competition here. And uh, the model we are uh, looking into is a Kuno duopoly, now same marginal cost. Now, of course, we allow for different marginal costs. Firm one has marginal cost K1, firm two has marginal cost K2. We have the same linear demand function we previously assumed, and we have profits as a function of your own and of the rival's cost. And what, we, what is uh, stated here already, which I didn't animate here for whatever reason, uh, is the so-called reduced uh, profit function, reduced profit function. Uh, this is already the function which gives you profits already off the, the marginal cost. So uh, this is exactly the same what we did when we uh, calculated the reduced profit function for uh, the monopoly. So remember, we uh, I introduced you to uh, the, the Cournot uh, case. And once you were looking into this uh, into this diagram. Here we had a maximization case for Kuno. And what you are doing here, when you want to derive the, the uh, radius profit function, you just solve these uh, two first order conditions here, okay, the two, and then you, you obtain some Q1 and some Q2. Uh, actually, it's here an X1 and an X2 because I use X's here for quantities, and substitute these values up here in uh, the, 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 the profit function. Okay, uh, that's what you're doing. I'll try to jump back here. And uh, oh, my handwriting is really bad here, but uh, I have uh, a strange position of my tablet here. Okay, now does that make sense? Uh, does that make sense what we are doing here? Uh, you see, first of all, again, this S value, the market size is important because it increases your profit. It's also important, and what you see here, you always, if you calculate that, you might make errors in calculation. You would, should, that, therefore, you should always check, check your results. And what you see here, this is firm I. If firm I's cost increase, your own uh, profit decreases. That's why we have the minus here. That makes sense. If your rival's cost increase, your profit increases. That also makes sense. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and finally, uh, the effect of your own cost here, the effect of your own cost, KI, on your profit is stronger than the effect of your rival's cost, KJ. What does this mean? If both of you increase costs, you don't get a competitive disadvantage, but nevertheless, your, your, your uh, profit will go down or put it in other way in, in terms of, of R&D. If you both succeed in uh, re reducing your, uh, your uh, cost, you don't get a competitive advantage uh, with respect to revival, but nevertheless, your profit increases. Why now? Because profit is, uh, excuse me, not profit, uh, demand is downward sloping and demand will increase, okay? Okay, that, that's what is, uh, and actually what you will do in the assignment uh, class, you will really derive uh, this uh, reduced profit function. Okay, once we have this, we can move on and calculate our incentive to innovate. And what we learned uh, last uh, week already, this incentive to evade is no innovate is nothing else than the profit you make once you realize uh, the, the, the innovation minus the profit you make if you do not invest in an innovation. Note here two important things. First of all, uh, it matters what the, your rival's costs are, what the K2 is actually, okay? Uh, and uh, the point is that you are the only one who can uh, realize or introduce this innovation as, is, as in a previous case. Later in this lecture, we will assume that if you don't innovate, your rival will. But here, it's uh, like in the example I gave you last week, if you're Daimler and your employee comes up with an idea on, on how to, on how to uh, improve your production technology, uh, only either you can innovate or no one can. Okay? So either you innovate, either you move from K1 to K1 lower bar, or no one does. Okay? Yeah, now what you get here is just this expression. It's this expression 4s over 9 times something. And here we have 
uh, the degree of the cost reduction, K1, old cost minus K1, lower bond, new cost. And again, what we see here, your incentive to innovate increases in the market size S, uh, yeah, and so on, okay? Now, our, in order now, of course, uh, to, to, to compare that with the Bertrand case, we have to make some assumption, and we start with the assumption here that in the very beginning, we start out with a symmetric uh, situation, namely where both firms uh, originally have the same cost. That would mean that we just uh, can cut out this K1 and K2. And what we can show here now, and what you might perhaps have uh, expected, why might you have that expected, that uh, Bertrand competition leads to higher incentive to innovate than Cournot. Now, yeah, in the monopoly case we saw, or in, in the original case of Arrow, we compared uh, Bertrand competition, tough competition with uh, no competition at all with the monopoly cause case, and what we saw is that the monopoly uh, had a, the monopolist had a lower incentive to innovate. Now what you see here, the same holds in a sense if we compare Bertrand with, with Cournot. Uh, Bertrand is a tougher form of competition, and we get the result that uh, Bertrand firms or a firm under Bertrand competition has a higher incentive to innovate, a higher willingness uh, to pay for innovation than a Cournot case. In order to show that, just we have to compare this thing here, uh, the, the Cournot uh, monopolist gain from innovation with that of the Bertrand uh, uh, firm. And that's what we are doing right now. Here Bertrand, here Cournot. And here is just a proof. So uh, what is clear again, this, this change or the, this degree of the innovation, K minus K1 uh, or K lower bar, just drops out because this is the same. And we compare this, uh, the S also cancels out. And so we compare this A minus K from the Bertrand case with the 4 over 9 times A minus K lower bar in the Cournot case. Okay? And if you want to show that, uh, I, I gave you the, the, the steps in, in the next uh, in the next equation uh, or the next inequality here, uh, we, we just put these 4 over 9 a minus k uh, on the other side here. And again, as I did last week, I just uh, apply uh, this condition that we have uh, uh, non drastic innovation. Remember that the price is always, uh, the monopoly price is always a minus k lower bar over 2. Okay? Embarrassing error. Of course, okay. Uh, what is the price always? What keep do I keep telling you? It's A plus K over two. Okay, we, we did that 1000 times, okay? So please, uh, I, I cannot erase it here, but uh, so price is always A plus K over two. Why does that make sense? Yeah, otherwise uh, K is nothing else than, oh, I, I Put to something which you cannot see, but k is nothing else than the cost. It would mean that if we have this negative sign here, if you increase cost, you decrease the price. There, but that doesn't make sense, of course. So it must be a plus k over two. Yeah, a plus k over two. And uh, this would be the monopoly price, as we have don't have uh, a drastic innovation. This monopoly price is above. K1, or actually in this case K2, because that's the, the cost of the rival, but uh, uh, it's just the original K. Okay, and that's what I used here when I uh, impl uh, employed this, this condition here, and therefore we just can substitute a K1 lower bar with a value uh, which is larger, because this gives, uh, 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 we know that certainly then the left-hand side uh, or with a, excuse me, I have to put it other way around. We have to, to, we can substitute it with a value which is smaller because then the, the uh, resulting value is certainly bigger than uh, this original value on the left hand side. Therefore, if we introduce this like here, like this here, the, the 2k minus a, we get this here. Uh, simplifying this, we get 8 over 9 a minus k, and 8 over 9 a minus k is of course smaller than 1 times a minus k. And this would be the formal proof that under perfect competition, excuse me, under, under not under perfect, but under control competition, which is actually like perfect competition or works like perfect competition, the incentive to innovate is larger than under Cournot. So, so far, so good, because that's somehow exactly what we expected. Very tough competition, very high incentive to innovate, lower comp uh, competition, lower incentive to innovate. And then would that mean, or what does that mean in terms of uh, the comparison between Monopoly and Cournot? And here just begin the slide uh, exactly equally to the previous slide. And now I want to compare uh, the Monopoly case with uh, the, the perfect competitors. Okay, yeah, uh, now 
What I want to show you now is that it's possible that the incentive to innovate is larger under Monopoly than under Cournot. Or put it uh, differently, uh, we just derive the condition for which the incentive to innovate is the same under Cournot than under, under Monopoly. Okay? And in, on the next slide, I'm going to, to interpret that. Uh, what we are doing here is just comparing the delta M, uh, pi M, the in monopolist incentive to innovate, with the delta uh, pi C, which is the Cournot uh, duopolist incentive to innovate. And we do exactly the same as we did in the previous case, cut out these uh, values which uh, show up in each uh, term, and then compare the two. And uh, in order to show that uh, how do you proceed, you just define uh, epsilon is equal to K1 minus K1 lower bar, or, or, or put it differently, you just substitute up here in the Cournot case, uh, the, the K1 lower bar uh, with K1 lower bar is equal to, to epsilon minus, oh, I just put it wrong here, okay, is equal to K1 minus epsilon. We substitute that and then we, we calculate so our epsilon for which uh, delta pi C is the same as delta pi M, okay? And actually, if you do that, that's what I solved, delta pi m equal pi c for epsilon to obtain a result. That's exactly, and epsilon is nothing else than this, uh, this thing here now, okay? You, you get as a result this delta uh, pi here. I even could show you that in mathematical, uh, it's straightforward, okay? The interesting thing is, why is it so, or what does this mean? Uh, and actually, it's, it's, uh, it's not obvious, uh, this result. Even I got it wrong uh, in the very beginning when I did it first because it was so obvious for me and, and so, so logical uh, that, that uh, the firm under Monopoly might have a, a, a lower incentive to innovate. But here, in a sense, Schumpeter comes up, okay? And uh, I want to show it uh, in a minute, or, or I want to explain it right now, actually, uh, why or under what circumstance we, we get this result. Uh, the, the point is here is uh, what you see here, this condition, I don't know whether you know this writing is delta pi C and here the, the greater or smaller sign, uh, what, what this means here, it just means that delta pi C is greater, greater, oh, I should use the, the text marker rather than this here, I should use the text marker, is greater than delta pi M if K1 minus K1 lower bar is greater than this here. What does this mean? Now, the incentive to innovate under Cournot is bigger than under Monopoly if we have a, a large, a high, a big uh, innovation, okay, a large cost reduction. If the cost reduction is small, very small, we don't get a high incentive to innovate, and the incentive to innovate may be, may be higher under, under Monopoly, okay? Uh, and I think I'm going to explain that, yes, I have a... a, a a diagram on the next slide. Before I move on, I just want to mention briefly uh, the result I mentioned in the notes about, about the drastic innovation. For a drastic innovation, it's of course very straightforward. Drastic innovation means that uh, if you implement the innovation, you all have the, the uh, monopolist uh, profit with this drastic innovation. And now remember cannibalization. Under, uh, under Bertrand, you don't uh, uh, cannibalize anything because uh, in, a, in a symmetric situation in, Cournot, uh, in Bertrand, uh, the, the profit is zero. In Cournot, you have some profit, but the profit, of course, is much smaller than under, under Monopoly. Therefore, uh, the profit is higher than under Bertrand, but lower than under Monopoly. So you have cannibalization, but not so much as under Monopoly. So uh, for a drastic innovation, uh, I oh, I have to use now again the, the pen. For a drastic innovation, drastic innovation, uh, we clearly get uh, delta pi b. Oh, that's not a pi. That's something different. Pi pi b is larger than delta pi c, and this is larger than delta pi m. Okay, that's for a drastic di drastic innovation. Whereas for a non-drastic innovation or for a, for a particularly small innovation, it might be different uh, as far as these two guys as a comparison between Kono and, uh, and Monopoly is concerned. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. Uh, here I just uh, have some simulation. Here uh, A is 100, this is a vertical intercept, S is, is 1, K1 is 50, and then uh, so uh, K2 of course uh, would also be 50. K2 is of course the, the rivals uh, the rival's uh, uh, cost. And now you see here what you gain from innovation is somewhere I should have written what, what is the red uh, uh, curve here on the on the left panel uh, on this here, okay, is uh, the the, uh, the gain from innovation for the Cournot firm. The blue one is that for a monopoly. And you see if uh, you're 
So what is written here is actually your k lower bar. You see, I always keep changing my, my notation. So k lower bar. So if k lower bar is 50, you don't have an innovation, no cost reduction. If k lower bar is 40, you would be able to reduce your cost by 10. If k lower bar uh, is, is, is zero, you would reduce your cost by, by 50. So that's, that's a minimum. And what you see here is for, for, for large cost reductions, for large innovations, it's clear that Cournot is better than Monopoly. But here for a small cost reduction, you hardly see a difference. And that's why I, I produced this uh, right panel where I just, uh, I think this should be the difference here. Yes, uh, this is a difference uh, between Cournot minus Monopoly. And you see if we are in a, so here would be the zero, of course, the axis would be the zero. If you're in positive territory, uh, the incentive to innovate is larger than in, uh, in Cournot. If you're in negative territory, uh, it's larger in, in, in Monopoly. And what you see here for, for uh, Costs k lower bar again from mathematical token k lower bar is smaller than 35. Uh, excuse me, is higher than 35, and the cost reduction is smaller than 50. So 15 or 10 or something like that. The monopolist has a higher incentive to innovate. Okay, if the, there's a large cost reduction, uh, the 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 Kuno, uh, firm has a higher incentive to innovate. Yeah, how can we compare that, uh, or why is that the case? Yeah, the case is something which has got something to do with Schumpeter. Uh, the, the point that Schumpeter mentioned that it's important to, to have, of course, market power, but also to be a large company. And the point is the monopolist has a much larger output uh, than the firm under and, and, and the, and the About So the monopolist has, in this case, about an output of, of say, oh, with 50, it would be 25. Anyway, uh, because the price would be 75 and so on. And the monopolist would anyway have a higher output than the firm under, under, uh, when one of the Kuno, Kuno uh, duopolists. Okay, and uh, the point is, uh, Cournot is a market structure where you, if you have a small cost advantage, you increase your market share, but only a little bit. So if you have cost of uh, 45 and your rival has has a cost of 50, uh, your market share increases, but only by two or three or five percent. Okay, uh, that's different from Bertrand, where your market share immediately increases from 50 to 100 percent, and uh, therefore you only get now uh, a rather small increase in profit and that's why you have a small willingness to pay for this innovation. Your market size your, is small and therefore, or you, your, your firm size is actually small and therefore you have a reduced uh, incentive to innovate. Of course, that's different if you have a very large innovation which goes close to the, to the, to the uh, drastic innovation because then you will take over almost the whole market. Okay, you see, uh, the, the higher the cost reduction is, uh, the more uh, is the advantage or the incentive to innovation higher than under monopoly. Okay, so this is uh, the important point we have here. Okay, just a small question. Can a drastic innovation or is a drastic innovation here possible? Perhaps we should discuss that then uh, later on in the in Webex, okay? You should think why it's not possible here. <laughs> Given that you correct, uh, correctly calculate uh, the monopoly price with A plus K over two. <clears throat> After a short feedback round in, in, in uh, Webex, the question came up uh, what these graphs on the, on the right hand uh, side, I hope that this is a graph. Uh, uh, what this actually means. And I tried to explain it to you that the right hand uh, just depicts the difference we have on the left hand. So here, what you see here, you cannot read it, uh, but uh, uh, here, the, 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 the red line is a, the, the delta pi uh, C, that is the gain from innovation for the Cournot firm, uh, whereas the blue line is the gain from innovation for the monopoly. And here you see the difference, which is actually, this difference is depicted here. These are these 350. Okay, and here you see about here, they intersect. So the difference is zero, that's what we get here. Okay, and so it's just a difference and that's what's stated here. And what you see here uh, to the left of about 35, the difference is positive, meaning that uh, the firm under Cournot competition has a higher incentive to innovate in this innovation. This innovation is a given cost reduction, okay, from say from 50 to, to 20. And uh, to the right of this 35, uh, to the right of these 35, uh, the firm and the monopoly has a higher incentive to, to innovate, the higher gain from innovation. And that's why here uh, it's in the, in the negative territory. Okay, hopefully it's clear. If not, uh, 
Max will always be available in the tutorial class. Okay, yeah, we move now on to a welfare question. Of course, we also addressed a welfare when we discussed uh, Bertrand and Monopoly and saw that there is under provision of R&D or under investment in R&D. Now we show actually in a sense, uh, in, in, in this uh, sense of uh, welfare maximization of total surplus, that there can be over provision of R&D. That, that means that firms can invest too much in R&D. So welfare here is consumer surplus plus aggregate profits, the standard welfare measure in, in, in say, partial uh, ana analysis. And here uh, we have a so-called uh, uh, second or third best uh, welfare measure or, or yeah, welfare measure here because we do not look into the case where we have first best price equal marginal cost, but we just look into the case what happens uh, if we assume that the market structure is really uh, uh, if you assume that that market structure is really uh, a given as that the social planner has uh, to take the Kuno market structure as given and the only question the Kuno uh, the, the planner can ask should I introduce a certain innovation or should I not does introducing this innovation increase welfare okay so if the firm inno uh, innovates if firm one innovates does that increase welfare that's a question we ask and in order to do that we just look into uh, how welfare changes here welfare this is just this value this is uh, tedious to to calculate it's just uh, the the triangles and the rectangles we previously had okay and here uh, uh, this would be the old welfare measure uh, and of course then we introduce I don't know whether you can see the, the new one with K lower bar and compare that and substituting all that, you get these, these uh, uh, large uh, expression here. Again, you see what matters here is what matters here is, is uh, the extent of the cost reduction. What also always matters is the S, the market size, and of course, uh, all these other variables matter as well. So what we now want to do is we want to compare this change in welfare induced by an investment in R&D by the Kuno duopolis to the incentive to innovate uh, of the Kuno duopolis. And what we can show is that only under certain conditions, uh, we could also write here the smaller, okay. only if this greater sign holds, only if 2K2 is larger than K1 plus K1 lower bar, this investment is increasing uh, total surplus. Again, you calculate that as I, I did with the epsilon when we compared uh, the, the Kuno case with the monopoly case, okay, uh, in the in the assignment and in our problem sets as well as in the in the final exam, uh, you won't uh, it won't be necessary or you won't be asked to do these kind of general proofs with general parameters or variables. Uh, you would just have to calculate the values. You would have given a certain value of a. You would have given a certain value of s and so on. And you can exactly calculate. Okay, delta w is say is say 25 and delta pi c is 17. So welfare is increasing. Okay, that's what you should be should be able to do. Okay, yeah. Now, what, what does this mean? First of all, you, you should believe me and then check at home that this really holds. Okay, but does it mean that it's possible that uh, that it's welfare decreasing this investment? Now, yeah, if an it, it's uh, completely straightforward. If an inefficient firm invests in R and D, welfare may fall. What does this mean? Just suppose, oh my, I don't know whether I can say that on YouTube, but my, my, my standard example was, uh, which German car manufacturer do you think is not one of the most uh, efficient ones? Okay, so just write it in the, in the chat. Oh, I don't know whether this year we also could say it's a German auto manufacturer, but just write it in the, oh. Oh, I, I should now wait 30 seconds until you can can ask that. So uh, just uh, drop me this note uh, in, in, in WebEx, uh, whether you know any. And of course, I, again, I will uh, assign a, a participation point to the one who gives me a sensible, uh, a sensible uh, solution. So which I don't do that. OK, no point. This is the efficient in Germany. And now uh, just to show you how inefficiency might uh, arise, uh, just note that if delta W uh, is smaller than delta pi c and that if the investment cost i for this innovation are higher than delta w but lower than this gain from innovation of uh, these, these Kuno duopolists, the Kuno duopolists would invest in R&D. 
spending this eye, making some profit, whereas social planner, if uh, if she were to invest in R&D, uh, this I would be greater than delta W and we would have a loss in welfare because the gain from innovation for the social planner is less than uh, the, the less than uh, the, the cost of this. Uh, ah, very good. I, I now got uh, uh, got a very good answer here. Okay, so as I wanted to make a break anyway after this slide, I just make it here and ask you in the WebEx chat about this, uh, this topic. Exactly the answer I always use here, so I think I can use it. Uh, uh, actually, the, the, the German car manufacturer I always use is the one uh, for years on the verge of bankruptcy, it's Opel. Okay, uh, now suppose Opel has higher costs, say, than Volkswagen. Uh, what does this mean? If Opel invests uh, in, in R&D, uh, K1 is actually, okay, uh, so K2 is a cost of Volkswagen or say, say, say Daimler or something like that, which are lower than the current cost of, of Opel is K1, okay, and uh, K1 lower bar, what do you think, what kind of cost level Opel might uh, achieve? Actually, it's just K2, okay, so, but what you see immediately is uh, if K2 is equal to K1 lower bar, uh, then, then the left hand side is uh, just uh, just uh, do the minus here. Uh, I just cannot. So, so you would get rid of here of of the of the two, and you would have uh, k two, which is actually equal to k one lower bar, is smaller than k one, and therefore uh, the, the 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 smaller than sign holds. Okay, I I have to con. I, I write it down here. So, two k lower bar is great. Is is actually then not greater is smaller than K1 plus K lower bar, okay? So K lower bar is, is the cost of the, the, the Daimlers and the Volkswagens. K1 is the original cost of, of Opel and they might uh, introduce uh, uh, an innovation which leads to uh, a lower cost here or the same cost as, as Volkswagen. And you see that would be detrimental to welfare at least in the terminology or in the definition we use up here as uh, the sum of consumer surplus plus aggregate profit. How can we explain that? And I have to raise it once again so that you, it's legible what I wrote here. Uh, this is a so-called business dealing effect. Uh, Opel then, of course, would increase its po profit, but this increasing profit comes uh, to a large degree from their rivals, from the Volkswagens, Daimlers, and so on. This is what is called the business dealing or profit destruction effect. And from the viewpoint of a social planner, this is just redistribution. We, uh, we distribute or redistribute profits from one firm to the other. And the firm, uh, Opel in this case, does not take into account its externality, its external effect on its rival's profits. Okay? So in a sense here, this, would de this might even decrease social welfare. However, of course, consumer surplus is still increasing. Consumer will always like that uh, uh, some firms introduce innovations because that always leads to... to a welfare increase because prices would go down. Okay, that, that's always uh, always the, the question here, whether this welfare uh, measure, uh, just assuming that aggregate profits enter the, the welfare uh, function or the social surplus function in the same way or with the same way as consumer surplus uh, is, is a right kind of assumption. Okay, uh, back uh, to uh, uh, another twist. So this externality would be the so-called pecuniary. I don't know, probably you cannot read that externality. It's different from the standard kind of uh, negative uh, externality like like uh, pollution, because it's uh, it's over the market. So some people wouldn't even call it a, an externality because it's via the market. But of course, it, it still is an externality. You are affected as a company. Okay, so we move on here. To our question, until now, we uh, back uh, to uh, uh, another twist. To our question, until now, we assume that if some firm thinks about uh, investing in a new technology, in, in a new process, it was always the only one uh, to invest in this new technology. So it didn't have to be afraid what happens if it does not invest. Very often, we will have a different structure. Namely, the question is, if you don't, do not invest, the ri your rival, your competitor might invest. And this is actually the question uh, David Gilbert, uh, uh, or I don't know what's first name of Gilbert, Richard, Richard Gilbert and David Newbery asked in 1982. And they asked, they put this question slightly different. They asked, uh, will monopoly persist 
if uh, innovative entry is possible and also put that in terms of uh, the so-called of the so-called uh, patent system okay now what is the situation uh, hopefully then then it gets clear the monopolist holds a patent and produces with some marginal costs k and now uh, if there is a potential entrant entry is only possible with a new technology uh, let's call that innovative entry and now the 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 the, the change uh, from previously it's now it's an outsider, say an R&D laboratory, which has discovered and patented a new technology, which would allow this, this process innovation, which would allow the production at, at lower costs. And now the important point is it sells a new technology in an auction. So if you're the monopolist, if you say, if you're Microsoft uh, having your operating system and someone comes up with an innovative uh, new operating system, call it Linux, uh, then uh, the point is either you uh, invest in that or your rivals will invest in that and if your rival uh, of course you uh, invest you get a competitor okay so uh, we now changed and you will see that in more formal terms uh, in a second because then it should become clearer first of all uh, i will just put the, the down the, the questions we are going to to ask here uh, the question is who will invest more in r d uh, who has a higher willingness to pay for the new technology is it a potential entrant or is it an incumbent so if if someone comes up with say a new internet browser or, or a browser at all, an internet browser, will it be Microsoft uh, wanting to, uh, trying to defend its, its operating system monopoly, so to say, or will it be a, an entrant who uh, introduces this new technology? Or, and then uh, what we now have is really the threat of entry, which we didn't have. And we want to look into how this threat of entry affects the monopolist's willingness to pay for an innovation. Will that increase uh, the incentive to innovation? And therefore, of course, the question is, uh, are monopolists innovative or how in innovative are they compared to the case of uh, a legally blockaded entry? Okay, Actually, in the previous case, we really had a legally blockaded entry. Our monopolist uh, didn't have to be afraid of, of uh, creative destruction because there was no entry possible. And therefore, we ask whether the monopoly will persist so that whether the monopolists will, will introduce this innovation or whether, whether uh, say, an entrant will enter and take over the market. And therefore, that would mean if you have the patent system, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, which, which then protects these new technology, does it then create opportunities for firm with monopoly power to maintain their monopoly power? Okay, these are the questions I'm going to address with this simple model, and you will see it's only two slides because it's so straightforward here. Uh, so what we previously already had was the entrance willingness to pay, or now this would be like the, 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 the firm under competition's willingness to pay for a non-drastic innovation. So we have a non-drastic innovation. Uh, now, if you have an entrant uh, and a low-cost technology is available, if this entrant entered, and it's a non-drastic innovation, the monopolist will still be in the market. So we have a second firm in the market producing with the original technology K. This is the former monopolist, the incumbent. And the entrant will then have the lower cost uh, K lower bar. Okay, the, the lower cost K lower bar. And now, of course, what does it earn? We have a non-drastic innovation. Uh, it will then her, uh, earn just the duopoly profit uh, being the low-cost firm. I don't know where you see my my mouse if I put it here you know, hardly uh, if it's a low-cost firm why uh, the the why the 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 other firm the incumbent is a high cost firm if you think in terms of of uh, a Bertrand competition uh, you would have a high cost uh, incumbent here of course uh, uh, then you this would be just your this would be just your Bertrand competition uh, profit your your rectangle and the Kuno it's just the, the profit of the of the lower cost firm in a duopoly profit, okay? Now, uh, what is the monopolist's willingness to pay? Now, the monopolist, if the monopolist acquires new technology, and I think I stop experimenting with the laser pointer, the monopolist's willingness to pay uh, is just the profit if it invests in R&D or if it introduces it innovation minus a profit if it doesn't. Now, if it doesn't invest, it gets the duopoly profit of a high cost firm because then that's different from previously. Uh, now, in, in the previous case where we didn't have the threat of entry, this would have been just uh, the monopoly profit with the original technology, okay? With the original K. But that would be wrong. This would be our standard kind of cannibalization. Uh, and that's what we have in, in the previous case in the error model. But now, so I erase it again, okay? I don't erase it, I just uh, cut it out here. Uh, but now, uh, your duopoly profit or your case in which you don't innovate is just a duopoly profit of a high cost firm now so hopefully you 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 understood the the, the notation here 
the first variable here in this duopoly profit is my own cost. The second variable is my rival's cost. My own cost here are the high ones. My rival's cost are the low ones. Okay. And if I invest as a monopolist in a new technology, I'm of course the monopolist with the new technology now allowing for lower cost. Now this is my willingness to pay of the monopolist. Okay. Yeah. And now the, 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 the really good thing here is about this, the, the amazing uh, thing about this model is that it's straightforward to show that it's always a monopolist who innovates. To see with no chance that uh, the duopoly profit of the, of the entrant, that is a willingness to pay of the entrant, is lower than the willingness to pay of uh, the, the incumbent of the monopolist. Uh, to see this, just rearrange it. Okay, so I just have used uh, these, these two things here. Okay, I just substituted it. And I just rearrange it, put this uh, duopoly profit of the, the high, high uh, cost uh, monopolist from duopoly profit on the other side. What do you see here then? You see here on the left hand side, this is nothing else as the sum of the duopoly profit in an industry where you have two firms, where one firm has high cost and the other firm has a low cost. But the sum of the duopoly profits, of course, is always lower than the monopoly profit. In particular, if the monopolist has, has low cost, okay? So this is straightforward. The monopoly profit in homogeneous good industry is always higher than the profit of two non-colluding duopolists. And even if they formed a perfect cartel, uh, they would have a hard time to uh, allocate, uh, in a sense, production because uh, actually the high cost firm should not produce and uh, the low cost firm would have to produce everything. So here what we get immediately and what is completely general is that the monopoly profit so completely general, I mean, not only depending on some, some kind of uh, linear demand function or something like that, uh, is completely general, is that the monopolist has a higher incentive to innovate. And this is what uh, Sean Tirol calls the efficiency effect. The industry structure moves in the direction of higher total industry output. Okay? So we just get a number of answers here from this uh, single slide. And that, that's an interesting thing about this, this model from, 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 uh, from uh, Gilbert and Newbery. So what we, we see here is that the monopolist inv will invest more in R&D due to the incentive to defend his monopoly. So he, really de he has more to lose from not winning the bid than the entrant has to gain from winning it. it. A monopoly is just more worth than a duopoly position. That's why the monopolist has a higher incentive to innovate. And this is, I think, rather, uh, rather plausible and intuitive, I, I hope. The second point is, do you know any companies who try to defend their monopoly? What do you think about killer acquisitions? Have you ever heard of that? Uh, Facebook took over, WhatsApp took over, Instagram and so on. Google also is uh, allegedly paying many, many competitors. That's what you see here in a sense, you try to defend your monopoly and you e easily can pay off uh, the potential entrance because this uh, new technology is worth more to you. Okay, moving on. And this is, I think, rather, uh, rather plausible and intuitive, I, I hope. The second point is that the monopolists are more innovative than firms acting under competition. What do I mean here? Actually, the monopolist has a higher willingness to pay, in this case, for the reduction, cost reduction from K to K lower bar than our, our Bertrand firm had. Uh, remember our rectangle. Why is that the case? They are because here, I think I have put it down. Uh, here, here the, the monopolist has to defend. He will defend this, this monopoly position, okay? If we had the, the Bertrand competition in the original situation with the identical cost of both firms, uh, it, it, it doesn't have or it cannot gain so much as the firm under competition. Actually, uh, probably it, it would be good to have uh, then just something like our comparison. I just try to find the respective the respective slide here where we where we compare the two. Ah, here here is what we have. Okay, uh, so. Uh, here, this was the, 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 the Bertrand case, okay, uh, slide 74. And uh, remember, uh, the incentive to innovate of the, of, the, of, the Cuneau, of the Bertrand firm was this year, okay? That would be, again, the incentive to innovate under, under competition. But now, uh, or this would also be equal to the incentive to innovate of the entrant. But what is the incentive to innovate of uh, the monopolist? Now, yeah, the monopolist, uh, if, if it doesn't innovate, what is its, its profit? It previously had... Uh, 
this is profit up here. Actually, that's what I didn't, didn't show you, but it previously had this profit. But if the rival innovates, its profit will be zero. Okay, its profit will be zero. And now if it uh, innovates, its profit will be equal because the rival keeps, uh, the, there is no rival then, there is no K. The rival has some, some costs up here probably, okay, was sometimes some 20 years in a logo in the market. So it, it's not restricted and it can charge the monopoly uh, price. And so its willingness uh, to pay is, is, is this here, which uh, generally should be higher than that uh, of, of the, of the monopolies. It should not be, it is higher, okay? So I should have made this clearer because of course the monopolist could also charge a price equal to K and realize uh, this, this uh, rectangle, okay? So it must be greater. Uh, the only problem you don't see it here well because it's not uh, drawn exactly, okay? Should be clear, hopefully. Of the thermal competition, at least uh, if, if it's not uh, too big an innovation. Okay, it's always different with with uh, with uh, almost drastic innovation. So, for instance, suppose uh, it's only an innovation like this here. Then, the, so if k lower bar would be equal to to this here, you see in this case it's certainly that uh, the monopolist has a higher incentive to to innovate than the firm under under uh, competition, the virtual competitor. Okay, yeah, uh, then the monopolist's willingness to pay for a new technology is greater under the threat of entry. That's what I showed you. So compared to this uh, case in which where you have uh, blockaded entry, uh, like uh, we had some, some 10 years or 15 years ago for postal services. So Deutsche Bundespost was not famous for its, its innovat innovativeness. Okay, uh, so uh, here it's clear that a monopolist is much uh, uh, more innovative if there is a threat of entry. And that's what actually drives uh, the Googles and Apples and Amazons. It's this threat of entry. They always want to stay ahead and defend their, their position. Uh, persistence of monopoly, uh, the, the almost the final point, yes, is the final point here. Uh, the patent system may allow to expand the lifespan of the monopoly. Okay, here, what we saw, it's always the monopolist who is going to, to innovate uh, or, or to, to acquire this new innovation. Uh, uh, this innovation and therefore uh, if we have successive generations of innovation this monopoly will persist and we will keep on uh, having this monopoly here and not uh, a pattern where uh, an entrant replaces a monopolist okay and in the notes I gave you some examples and you see also how hard these uh, incumbent monopolists work to defend their monopoly uh, Cabral gives an example on Xerox Xerox is well known for his copy machine actually uh, the best times have uh, been or are over probably, but uh, Xerox spent more on R&D than the rival IBM and they produced what is called a patent ticket and Xerox sued IBM and uh, IBM was an entrant and wanted to really enter this, this copy machine business, but they had to spend 25% of their R&D budget on their patent councils and, and on their, and their lawyers, okay? Uh, even the, the more interesting case is Eli Lilly. Why is it Eli Lilly? Because Eli Lilly is, is a pharmaceutical company which once even had a base uh, a distribution center in Gießen. And uh, Eli Lilly was a market leader for insulin, for conventional insulin. I don't know whether this is the uh, right kind of, of, uh, of uh, expression. This conventional ins insulin was produced, I think, from, from pig stomachs or something like that, from the pancreas of, of, of pigs. Uh, and this was a rather demanding uh, uh, process and, and expensive protest process. And in 1978, Genentech came up and introduced and was successful to, to, to develop insulin uh, via biotechnology. Okay, they developed what is called synthetic human insulin. And now the question was, they were this company and they really uh, auctioned off these, these, uh, these patents for, for this uh, process to produce this synthetic human insulin. And it turned out that Eli Lilly, uh, the former monopolist on, on say, uh, insulin, was the one who, who won this auction and they defended, in a sense, their, their position. Okay? Yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, as always, drastic innovations will change uh, this situation. With drastic innovations, the willingness to pay off entrant and, and incumbent is, is, is identical because with a drastic innovation, you don't cannibalize, cannibalize anything uh, because you're driven out of the market. Uh, a, a very interesting uh, twist here with this uh, Gilbert Newbery uh, paper is the, the potential or the possibility of sleeping patents or of patent shelving. 
So the monopolist may obtain a property right of an innovation even though he makes no use of it. Okay, what does this mean? Firms often hold a large number of patents relating to the same process or product, uh, but use only part of them. I, I told you already about the patent ticket of, of Xerox. They, uh, they patented every conceivable way uh, you could produce uh, or could uh, manage a copy machine, okay, just to pre prevent others, uh, or in this case IBM, to enter the market, okay? Uh, actually, uh, the F that's what I wrote in, in, in the notes here. The FTC, the, the American Federal Trade Commission, which is an antitrust authority, they are ordered in the 17th then that Xerox must license their technology to all entrants at nominal costs. And that led to a, a drop in the share of Xerox by 50% between 1972 and 1977, at least according to Pepper Richards and Norman. Uh, so the point is, what happens here with this, uh, with these, with these uh, patent shelving or, or sleeping patents? Now, uh, what you want to do is you want to prevent imitation and you want to present uh, competition uh, where competition tries to invent a round, okay, to find another way to, to become a rival. And the formal proof is, again, straightforward. Now, assume a new technology becomes available, allowing production of the product with some marginal costs. And this is now the important thing. These marginal costs lay, pay lower bar or higher than your cost, okay? Uh, you currently have. And the point is that the monopolist still has a higher willingness to pay uh, for this innovation, uh, where the willingness to pay is simply this expression, then uh, the, 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 the entrant, because uh, winning the duopoly position uh, with a high cost technology is much uh, worse, much less than defending a monopoly position. Of course, you will never n use it, this new technology, you will shelf it, okay? But you prevent rivals from entering. And uh, again, I could jump back to our, to our uh, previous case. Oh, I don't know where we uh, should still be here. Uh, to the to my previous diagram I produced it was this one which is hardly legible right now but the point is here I don't know what I can erase uh, so you are now the monopolist being here and you will pre prevent a rival to enter with if if your costs are k lower bar you want to prevent the rival uh, to enter with this uh, technology of course a rival will never enter under under Bertrand because uh, uh, because uh, its profit would be zero, uh, but you will try. Of course, if if the the, the cost or of uh, buying uh, this new technology, it nevertheless perhaps uh, will will accept it, and then it would consist uh, or then it it would be uh, a competitor. Okay, even if we have Cournot, it's always good to keep others out of the market. And the the message of the Newbert, uh, Gilbert Newberry paper is that you always have a higher incentive to to uh, invest in R&D uh, or, or to, to pay that if you're the incumbent, okay? And I think here uh, there is really an amazing example which is electronic ballasts, so uh, for uh, to be used in florists and lamps, so this is complicated electronic stuff. Uh, stuff in, uh, in Germany it would be elektronische Vorschaltgeräte für Leuchtstofflampen. Uh, I don't know where we have an idea uh, in, in the, if you were in the lecture hall at the university I would just show it to you, uh, but anyway, uh, these things uh, used to be magnetic, these, these, these ballasts. And uh, late in the 70s, two scientists came up with an alternative way, namely uh, no longer doing it magnetic in a magnetic way, but doing it electronically. And it was said that uh, this would reduce cost at least by 30%. Now, the interesting thing was that Magnetech was the one uh, who, who outspent everyone else. Okay, uh, the, the Magnetech was the incumbent with a, with a magnetic ballast and they bid the most, actually they bid uh, uh, royalties, a share of, uh, of, of their sales, okay, of, of the revenue. And what they did, they bought this, uh, they acquired this, this patent but never used it. And uh, it was so smart how they did it because of course, as they said uh, to the scientists, to the inventors, we pay a share of, every, of, of, of all of our sales as they, as they didn't produce it, they didn't have any sales and uh, they didn't have to pay anything, okay? Uh, actually, the two scientists went to court and were awarded the ch uh, damages of almost 100 million euros, uh, excuse me, dollars, okay? Uh, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the, the incumbent has a strong incentive uh, to, to, to buy a, a patent even though uh, she doesn't have uh, an incentive to use it, actually, okay? Uh, and this is really a problem also from the viewpoint of policy. That's why there is some compulsory licensing. If you don't use a certain patent, you have to license it at, at some uh, 
decent uh, amount to, to arrival. And it's also that patent renew fees, we will get back to patents uh, later on in the next but one chapter, that patent, uh, if you want to keep that patent, you have to pay renewal fees, and these might be increasing over time. Okay, coming back to our lecture, I just got the question. Okay, I'm still here, just uh, switching my, my uh, windows here. Uh, killer acquisitions, that's what I was talking about. And actually that's somehow a, a related argument and actually uh, the, the same kind of argument holds is killer acquisitions. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Apple is accused of that in particular, Facebook and Google are accused of that. They just buy up uh, small rivals, small competitors so that they never become a threat to them, okay? So that's currently a big discussion both uh, here in, in Europe and in the US. And uh, let's see whether merger policy changes in that respect. Uh, actually, I just could go down in a basement and try to find this small electronic ballast. Uh, I had to change a lamp uh, recently, uh, but I forgot to use it and to bring it here. Actually, uh, I could have brought the, the, the what is kaput. The one which is no longer working. Okay, short break. I just ask for for your questions in WebEx. Whether we only talk about drastic and non-drastic innovations in Kono competition. Uh, actually, uh, in Kono, so we always talk about or mostly talk in our models about non-drastic innovations because drastic innovations are typically different. Uh, it's not so. Uh, with drastic innovation, uh, the problem is not so interesting because uh, everyone else is driven out of the market and there's not much to say. Uh, yeah, so, so that's about it. Uh, and with Kono, uh, with a drastic innovation, it wouldn't just matter that uh, you, uh, that, that uh, in principle, uh, an inefficient uh, competitor can survive because drastic competition means uh, by definition that an, in, that an inefficient uh, competitor cannot survive because you have such a high uh, cost or so big cost advantage. We might, or uh, hopefully that, that's enough for the moment, okay? I now want to show you uh, some, some uh, yeah, slightly different uh, kind of argument where we again look into these kind of increasing dominance. Uh, what we just looked in was the Gilbert Newbery case. What they actually have is something like uh, the Bertrand duopoly, even though that holds for all uh, market structures, and uh, where we had these uh, incumbent versus entrant uh, situation. Uh, it might be slightly different if we have uh, Kuno, and it's not in the very beginning so that we have uh, a monopoly in the market, but we have competition to begin with, uh, we might get slightly different situation. Now, so uh, the, the, the point here is, uh, or the question here is, how does market structure ev evolve if there is a sequence of innovations? Okay. Uh, so in a sense, it's a non-drastic innovation again. Each innovation is patented like in the Gilbert Newbery setup. Uh, and, and we have a generally asymmetric situation uh, where uh, we have uh, an, uh, one more efficient and one less efficient uh, firm. So, so firm one would have lower cost than firm two. And there is an innovation, process innovation, uh, which, which allows cost or production at costs which are below uh, either of the original costs. Okay? Uh, with Bertrand, it's rather straightforward, and I could jump back uh, for the third time to the same slide, uh, that it's always uh, the cost leader who has an incentive to invest in R&D, and so that we get what is called increasing dominance. Okay, uh, I, I will uh, briefly jump back again. So the point is here, in the very beginning, uh, if we had uh, both firms having this, uh, this, this K here, okay, uh, in, in terms of cost, and one firm introduced uh, a cost reduction to, say, K lower. It's always the, the leading firm. If you once have a cost advantage, uh, you will increase that cost advantage over time. And that's what is called uh, increasing dominance here in that model. Okay, that's what you also have in this. Hopefully that was clear despite this jump in the video, okay? But uh, if this uh, is unclear, just ask me then uh, in, in WebEx. I will explain it once again, but uh, just go down should, should really be no problem. The setup in which uh, uh, we have, uh, or the setup we just looked into where we had this, uh, this monopolist in the market, okay? Where we had an asymmetric uh, situation to begin with, which was very asymmetric because it was a situation where uh, there was only uh, 
uh, jumping too much ahead, uh, in which there was only a single firm active. And uh, so it was a monopoly to begin with, and then we got a duopoly once we got entry, whereas this the situation in which uh, the monopoly defended its position. But the point is, with Bertrand duopoly, uh, only one firm is active, and this firm, uh, the cost leader, will always have the higher incentive to innovate. And that's really uh, the, the, thrash, uh, the, the rational we previously had. Now, Kono. And that's what John Vickers uh, showed in a rather famous paper in, in 1986. Kono is different. Again, what, what I have here is just what I derived above these gain from innovation here. And now I really confuse you totally, I guess, uh, with this three-dimensional three three-dimensional uh, diagram, uh, which I have problems to, to really understand, unless I have Mathematica and can turn it around. What you see here, uh, actually, I, I am going to explain it later, but here we start out with a situation where firm two, the high cost firm has cost of, of, uh, of 100, and here A and S are the demand parameters, and here is a K1, uh, these are the costs uh, the, to begin with, the original costs of, of uh, the, the, the low cost firm, and here this K are the cost you, uh, you, uh, of, of, the, of the process innovation, okay? So if K2 is, is 100, K1 might be might be 80 here, uh, excuse me, 90 here, and K might be 80. So uh, if uh, K firm one introduces this process innovation, it would reduce its co production cost by 10. If firm two uh, introduces this uh, innovation, it would reduce production cost by 20. And what you see here is, here you have the willingness to pay of the two firms. And you see here in the red area, uh, it's actually the high cost firm which has a higher incentive to innovate. And in the blue area, it's a low cost firm which has a higher incentive to innovate. And in this dark blue area, it's actually where we get uh, patent shelving that is a low cost firm innovates, but a high cost firm uh, doesn't. Oh, Roy, you didn't understand it. It's not a problem uh, because I just put or made, uh, in a sense, uh, cuts along these these contour lines here so what i did i cut this thing here along this line here so uh, i cut at at uh, at uh, three different uh, values of of k1 at 65 at 75 and 90 and what i have here written is willingness to pay of the high cost firm minus willingness to pay of the low cost firm the high cost firm is firm 2 firm 2 and the low cost firm is firm 1 Remember, the high cost firm had costs of 100. So suppose, and here's a K. Here is the, 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 the actually, I should have used K lower bar here. Uh, actually, this is the new, the, the new technology. This is the pro production cost with the new technology. Now, suppose if you have 90, if K is 90, that would mean uh, firm, firm one uh, wouldn't gain anything because it already has cost of firm two. But so this is in a sense the Opel case. Okay, uh, Volkswagen has a cost of 90. Opel has costs of 100. Who has a higher incentive to innovate? Who has a higher willingness to pay? Yeah, here we see that actually uh, the willingness to pay is higher for the high cost firm. It's in a positive territory. Okay, this is not uh, so much uh, a surprise, and this holds uh, for for uh, the the whole range from say 100 to something like 80. Okay. But then, uh, so what, what does this 100 till 80 mean? So if firm one has has a cost of 90, uh, and and uh, this this innovation is say 95, uh, firm uh, one will have a, a lower willingness to pay for this innovation as uh, firm two. Same holds for if it's 85. Okay, 85 still uh, Opel would still have the higher incentive to innovate. Now this. Similar is, uh, is here for 75. And what is interesting for 75, uh, this firm, uh, if the cost advantage of Volkswagen is so high, they will uh, buy, uh, and that's the patent shelving here, they will buy this new technology allowing cost at 90 to prevent Opel from uh, reducing its cost to 90. It has a higher willingness to pay. And of course, there will be patent shelving here in, in this region here. Okay, is that clear hopefully? If, and if you have a large cost advantage, K1 uh, equals 65, you still have a lot of, so K, if K1 is 65, all of these innovations here are in a sense senseless for you because th they would lead to higher costs. Nevertheless, you buy them, you have a higher willingness to pay because you want to prevent your rival from buying it. And of course, the rival doesn't have a very high willingness to pay for an innovation which uh, leads to a cost decrease from 100 to say 90 if you as a rival have cost of 65. Okay, so the willingness of your rival is low and you will then buy it. Yeah, hopefully you, you got some idea here. Uh, and, and of course, you see here uh, if the cost reduction is, is larger, like, 
like here, you the, the low cost firm will be higher in, have the, the higher incentives. So I don't know where it has become clear, but we have derived a I just want to show you this mathematical slide in order uh, to give you some impression how you can play around and I don't know whether this helps you uh, to get this kind of three-dimensional, I don't know, feeling. Just try. Here you see this diagram, hopefully you also hear me. And uh, if you have Mathematica, I think uh, GeoGebra should also, I don't know whether you can work something like that, but here you see you can uh, I don't know how well you can see that in, in YouTube, but uh, you can just play around, okay? So that, that's what you can do and uh, get an understanding of that. Okay, so that, that's the only thing I wanted to, to show you. And of course, it's very straightforward to derive all these uh, points. And uh, I then started to derive the, the lines. That's what you see here, which I then produced in order to uh, start this, this diagram. Yeah, I just move on then now here. The number has the higher incentive. So I don't know where it has become clear, but we have derived a number of results by means of the simulation, and these results are summarized by, 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 by Wickers here in his paper. So the originally high-cost firm has a greater incentive than the low-cost firm if the initial cost disparity and the superiority of the new technology are not too large. Otherwise, the lower cost firm has the greater incentive. So if originally uh, you are only at a small cost uh, uh, disadvantage, okay, you have cost of 100, your arrival has costs of 90. Of course, typically what, what Vickers has in mind is probably this range. If uh, this small, you have a small cost disadvantage here, and you will have a higher incentive to, innovate, to invest in this range here, in these cost reductions. You, and here, uh, I don't know whether because I don't remember, I should look it up, whether because also considered patent shelving, but you would also get the situation in which uh, the, the high cost firm has a higher incentive to innovate or to invest in, in these technologies. Okay? For, for other technologies, if, if the, if the uh, cost reduction is larger, like here, uh, from, from say from 90 to, to 60, you'll see that uh, the willingness to pay is clearly in a negative territory and the low cost firm has a higher incentive to innovate. Yeah, hopefully you, you got it. That's rather complicated, but still much easier to understand than uh, my three-dimensional uh, diagram. Okay, uh, so what we see here, however, is that action-reaction is possible. Okay, so what does this mean? Again, I have to raise it. If originally, suppose uh, the, the uh, originally Volkswagen introduced this innovation and came up with 90, and now the next innovation is this one leading to, say, 85, then it will be Opel. Who is the next one to innovate? Okay, so we get an action reaction, and then again, it will be if it's again uh, a, a rather small innovation, it will be probably uh, Volkswagen again. So we get what 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 uh, what Vickers calls the action reaction pep, uh, pattern. Uh, there's another paper by Agior Vickers, and I forgot who is the third author who do that in a dynamic way. And what what really is interesting is this final conclusion here. If we compare Bertrand competition with 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 uh, Cournot competition, Bertrand competition. Uh, which is good, and I, I just want to quote here, uh, because petrol competition, which is good for consumers in the short run, leads to increasing dominance, which can be bad for them in the long run. In particular, price might remain at or approximately at the cost level of the high cost firm. That's what we saw. In Bertrand, no incentive to reduce price. By contrast, Kono competition, which is less good for consumers in the short run, can lead to action reaction and falling price over time. In short, more competitiveness. Today leads to less competition in the future and vice versa. So again, somehow we get a Schumpeterian uh, result. More competition uh, today uh, leads to less competition in the future and vice versa. I think this was the large last part uh, about uh, 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 this, this uh, arrow model and, and the, the, the other derivatives, like the, the Gilbert Newberry model. Uh, so so what, we, what we really did, did before I, I get back to the next, uh, very briefly to the next uh, chapter, is we looked into uh, the incentive to innovate under competition and under monopoly. If the market is, is closed in a sense, if only one firm can innovate and must not be or, or need not be afraid of, of a rival introducing an innovation. 
Okay, that was uh, the first two cases. We already saw that in these first two cases, uh, we get a very nice uh, twist if we allow for uh, Cuno competition, because here we already got some Schumpeterian topics, namely that it's really firm size, which is important. So we got a result that a firm uh, under Cuno competition might have a lower incentive to innovate than a, than a monopolist, uh, just because it doesn't attract so much uh, market share. Okay, and then we introduce this uh, Gilbert Newbury framework where we have the threat of entry, where it's clear if you don't innovate, your rival will, and uh, therefore the question is no longer uh, will you stay in the current uh, uh, in your current nice uh, monopoly position, but uh, if you don't innovate, uh, you will get a uh, you will get a tough competitor. Okay, and then we saw that this might even lead uh, to to uh, a situation where. Uh, we get sleeping patterns. And finally, uh, this, this uh, Wickers model, where you hopefully got my, my diagrams, at least uh, the one with the, uh, the two-dimensional one, uh, where we saw that even though in the, in the short run, bear trauma might be very good, in the long run, it might not be so good because it leads to increasing dominance. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, you saw that, uh, and I told you that I really like the Cuno model because uh, it gives... Uh, Nice, or it has nice features. You get uh, coexistence and positive market share uh, of uh, firms with different cost levels. And actually, what we are doing next uh, is looking into the Das Gupta Stieglitz model. And the Das Gupta Stieglitz model is just a Cuno model, where the difference to the pre previous models is that in the previous model, we had always only one firm which invested in RT. Okay? It was only the either the incumbent or the entrant. It was only one firm which invested. But if you look, for instance, in the automotive industry, uh, everyone invests in RT. Everyone wants to have a, a new battery. Everyone wants to reduce production costs, even irrespective of whether it's Daimler, whether it's Tesla, whether it's, it's Volkswagen, and so on. So what we want to model next here is a, a situation in which we have an oligopoly, so several firms, and in which each of these uh, Oligopolis invests in R&D. And again, what we'll, we'll look into uh, is uh, cost reductions. It's always uh, the easiest thing to look into cost reduction. And uh, that's what uh, Das Gupta and Diggins did in a famous, uh, in a famous paper in, in 1980. Uh, and uh, again, it's a process innovation. And I just want to give you a preview how that looks like here. Uh, we have uh, here the level of, of R&D. Uh, excuse me, it, it's not the, the output here. This is a level of R&D expenditure here. Okay, and the, the point is, if you don't invest in R&D, your production costs are infinite. And if you invest in R&D, your production costs decrease. Okay, but they decrease at a diminishing rate. So if you invest, say, 10 million here, you get a rather high uh, cost reduction. But if you have already rather low cost and you invest 10 million here, you have diminishing returns. The cost reduction uh, is, is, is only very small. Yeah. To next week, I also will introduce an alternative form, but I will get back to that uh, next week. And I think I'm I'm running out of time here, but I think we we did what I uh, pretty much wanted to do. So I would like to to thank you for discussing that uh, with me. I will be available on. So again, you saw a strange ending, but anyway. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, this uh, content as much as I did. So the interesting point about uh, these this, uh, two chapters on Arrow and then on the uh, Gilbert, uh, Newbery, Gilbert Newbery paper and also the final part on Vickers, it really uses our standard kind of very simple workers model, the monopoly model, the, the Bertrand competition model and the Cournot competition model, introduces a, a single uh, product innovation and you really uh, can derive far-reaching Result. So, theory is really powerful. Uh, that's that's it for today. Uh, see you again here on YouTube uh, next week. And of course, I'm available now for some discussion in Webex. Bye.